book of Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. I had somebody ask me how was my trip. I said it was, it was tough. It wasn't as... Uh, sometimes you want to go from point A to point B. And you don't want C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J in the middle. Amen. You want to get it from Alpha to Omega. Genesis to Revelation. Well, I have found that life don't work that way. Amen. And that this, uh, this trip of uh, 700 miles to Alabama, 750, ended up being a 2,500-mile uh, trip. Amen. And uh, I'll talk to you more about that later, but it was a lot of unintended consequences. But what happened while I was going, taking this trip was uh, I ended up in, in what, because of a certain situation, I had to, I had to make it halfway trip back to Texas to pick up something, um, I hit a roadblock, detour. Can I tell you something about detours? I hate them. <laughs> Especially when I know the trip. You know, for uh, now, 40 years, I've been going to Alabama two or three times a year. That's a lot of trips. I know how to get there. So I'm on my way to pick up something, and uh, I hit a detour. So I followed the detour, and it brought me all the way back around to where I got back on the detour, one hour later. So now I'm an hour behind of what I'm scheduled to work. Now I'm screaming in the vehicle. <laughs> it's not my vehicle. I mean, someone else's. It's a Chevrolet. And I'm not enjoying the trip at all at this moment. And I literally started screaming. I just started, I didn't curse, I just screamed. Ah, you know, I just got mad because I'm by myself. I ain't hurt nobody serious. And uh, when I got done screaming, I settled my spirit down. And I said, Jerry, enjoy the trip. Just enjoy the trip. And I found myself going through little towns, Boonville, Mississippi, Tishomingo, down into Carthage, Mississippi. I, I found myself going into places in Louisiana that I haven't been since I was a kid. And I just started enjoying the trip, looking at the lights, didn't care about what, how late I got there, how late I got back. I just, said, I just settled into it because I knew to fight it would be foolish. Amen. Because when that sign up says detour, you want to take the detour. Several things over the next few weeks I will share with you about detours, roadblocks, potholes, and distractions. Because that's what take, has taken place particularly in 2020 and 2021. It seemed like we wanted to go one route, we had to go another route. And we hit detours and we had to, and oftentimes you'll notice this about detours, they're nowhere near as fun as the regular road. They're usually bumpier, they're harder, they're, they're whiny. Uh, they, they, they're, but here's the thing, I'm a biker also. So I hit some detours, and Joseph, I said to myself, Seth, I want to ride this on my scooter. <laughs> hey, Amen. this is a good road for riding scooters on, but not so much in your sister-in-law's Chevrolet. <laughs> Numbers chapter 21, amen, starting in verse 4. Are you comfortable? We just talked about the Passover, which was part of the ten plagues in which released the children of Israel out of 400 years of bondage and slavery. There were slaves in the land of Egypt, and they lived in a place called Goshen. Goshen was, and now this is important, whenever it was dark, the plague of darkness hit Egypt, it was light in Goshen. God always looks after his people. It's an amazing thought when you look at the plagues, how they didn't affect, they didn't cross the boundary where the children of Israel were. Amen. The frogs didn't cross the boundary. The locusts didn't cross the boundary. The lice didn't cross the boundary. The hell that killed the cattle didn't cross the boundary. Amen. God protected his people in Goshen. Now, they, so they have seen miracles, but now they're on their way out. Amen. They're fixing to cross over. Uh, they're heading down. They're getting delivered. Amen. They don't know the route. They don't have uh, Google, GPS. They don't have, the, they don't have that. They, they know about where they're headed. Amen. Now, after 400 years, of course, the terrain has changed. The roads have changed. Things have changed. But Moses is going to be directed on how to get there. Now, on the way there, uh, several things happened. There was a group known, known as Korah. Korah and 250 men rose up against Moses and said, Hey, God don't only talk to you. He talks to us, too. Now, this is just good church dynamics to listen to. They got mad at the man of God. They got upset with him. They got upset with his God, and they, they began to fuss. And Moses, uh, he's an humble man. He says, I tell you what, guys, get you a censer, a golden censer, which was what they put incense in to worship. 
He actually wasn't golden, they were bronze. Amen. Get bronze censers and go out and stand before the tabernacle. Amen. And worship God. And let's just see who God decides on who's who. Okay. So we went out and the scripture says that as Moses and Aaron began to pray, the ground opened up and it swallowed 250 of Korah's folk. Now, it just swallowed them up. Now, you'd think at that moment, everybody would, would, would pucker up and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Do the right thing. No. Nay, I say unto thee, 14,000 and a half people began to rise up again in rebellion toward God, and God struck them with a plague, and they died. And Moses, every time this happened, Moses had to go before God and say, God, you put that back down just a little bit. Amen. Pull it back just a little bit. I, I promise you they won't stay rebellious. But they did. That's right. And they traveled a little bit further. And they moved a little bit further through life. And then Miriam, his oldest sister, dies. It breaks his heart. And then, and then Aaron dies. And it breaks his heart. And, and after Miriam dies, the people begin to complain. You brought us out here to, for us to die. And they begin to yell for, for sustenance. And they wanted something. They wanted water. We want water. We have no water. So Moses looks at a rock and he strikes it with his staff. God rebukes Moses at that moment and says to him, uh, because of what you did out of anger, I'm going to give you water. But because you didn't speak to the rock, you, def you let me just say it, in a, you, you defied me in front of the people of God. So you're going to get water, but you're not going to get into the promised land. Now, let me just say this to you. Moses did get into the promised land uh, a thousand and something years later. That's right. <laughs> Can you figure this out? Because Moses and Elijah ended up on a Mount Transfiguration in the promised land. Amen. Later on. So don't think because you leave here, everything's over. It's not. This is great news. It ought to be great news for all of you. Yes. Amen. So here's Moses. He gets a little upset. Later on, he begins to learn how to speak to it. And then his brother Aaron does. Oh, man. I mean, it's just discouragement. It's rough. It's hard. So then we find this in Numbers 21, verse 4. They travel from Mount Or along the route to the Red Sea to, do, to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient where it was discouraged on the way. They spoke against Moses and God and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. That food was manna that came every morning that never stopped. Amen. It was, by the way, it was not, it was not detestable. It was what some of y'all call tofu. Whatever you mix it with, it tastes like. Amen. You mix it with banana, you got banana bread. Mix with burger, you got manna burgers. Amen. You mix with tacos, you got Taco Bell. Amen. So whatever you do there, whatever you mix with. Then, then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bent the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, Hey, we sinned. We spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake, put it on a pole, Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. Everybody say, look and live. Amen. Amen. This is about worship, man. This is about looking at him. This is also the symbol of our medical field. Amen. The snake on the pole. So Moses made a bronze snake, put it on a pole. Then, and when anyone who was bitten by the snake looked at the bronze snake, they lived. John chapter 3 verse 14 tells us, Just as Moses was lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Now, before you sit down, let me just show you one more thing. This is the, this is, can everybody see this here? This is a map of where they were going. Follow me here, Dennis, if you would. Amen. So here's Egypt. Amen. Here's Goshen. This is where the people of Israel were, okay? Amen. Now, I'm going to show you this real quick. If I walk across this map all the way over here, and I come over here, this here is Jerusalem. You see this? This here would be known as the promised land. So you've got to go from here to here. The problem was the people fell into rebellion. They were disobedient toward God. You know, they stayed 40 years in, in, running around the desert. And so you think of that and say, why? Because they were in rebellion. Now, I know this map's a little hard to see. Let me show you another map. Okay, this is a little better. Okay. <laughs> they started here. And again, all they needed to do is to get to here. But here is the track. Down south, cross Red Sea, down south, snake bite, uh, complaining in the desert, water from the rock, uh, Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, and then they come all the way around here, and then we're going to loop around here for about 40 years right here, and then we're going to end up back over here, and then Joshua's going to take the crew 
through, uh, across this, what known as the Jordan, amen, into the promised land. Everybody follow that? Yeah. Amen. How many realize that this here is a lot longer than this? Yeah. That this here is full of detours, roadblocks, potholes. Yeah. How does, does that resemble anyone's life over the last few years? Amen. You wanted to get that job. You wanted to get to that place. You wanted that relationship. The next thing you know, you're going around, around and around and around. We're going to talk about that over the next few weeks. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Anoint my lips to share our hearts to hear and receive. Bless everyone that's watching today. In Jesus' name, everyone shout. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. I had JJ draw that for me. <laughs> that's not true. She'd have done a better job than I did. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, God has a wilderness for all of us. It seems like life is about a wilderness as you walk through it. And it's because he loves us. There's things he does for us in the wilderness that changes us. It affects us. And it's not the wilderness that's important, by the way, but rather our response to it, how we handle what we're going through. Uh, one of my favorite shows on TV, of course, is Forged and Fire. I love knives, as you know. And, and there's something about they, they'll take the knife and they, they, they forge it out of uh, metal and they beat it amen and then then of course after after they do that they have to put it into the water to harden it and i find life is a lot like that it's it's being forged out it often happens in the wilderness god gave a wilderness to john the baptist it produced a revival the father gave jesus a wilderness he launched his ministry god gave the children of israel a, a wilderness and after 40 years it, they finally made it into a nation it would appear that greater things are born out of seasons of suffering and seasons of comfort. God doesn't allow us to stay in comfort. He always throws a detour. There's always a detour. There's always something that causes something new in our life to remind us that he's in control. Several things they learned. They learned about God's power. Amen. The, the children of Israel did. As they moved through it, you know, they saw the ten plagues of peer pressure that came upon the Egyptians. They learned to obey God. Amen. That you have to follow the cloud or stay behind and freeze. Exodus chapter 13 says, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of a cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the, of the people. They had to follow it. In other words, have you ever heard somebody say, Come on, let's go! And then you got to wait on them? Yes. <laughs> God never did that. God said, I'm leaving now, amen, and the cloud takes off, and you either got under it, or you got sunburned, amen. At night, you stayed under the, under the fire, or you got cold, amen. God, God was directing them. He was leading them that way. So they learned how to obey God through that. They learned teamwork, always moving and breaking camp, break it down, rebuild it, set it up again, amen. They learned the chain of command. It was Jethro that went to Moses and said, hey, man, you're, you're wearing yourself out leaving with all these people. Put somebody in charge of 50 and 100, amen, set them up that way. And then he commanded the people, pay attention to Moses, amen. Let's just don't wear him out. They learned that they could do the impossible. You, you had to realize how many, and I've said this before, David, I, I cannot find a physical miracle in the ministry and life of King David. I mean, it's, it's not the stone that hit Goliath. It's not the dealing with the Philistines. It's not the, the, the men took care of him. Like, there's no miracles. There's just a man who had a heart after God. But with Moses, there's miracle after miracle after miracle. Yeah. Amen. The, the ten plague miracles that they saw, the, the, uh, the, the crossing of the Red Sea, when it, when it divided, you have to understand this thing. Go, go back to that Red Sea uh, picture real quick. The uh, I, I don't care which one. I just want them to see something here. Look, at, this thing is as wide as any river you've ever seen. Right. This is a sea. Amen. The, I, I don't even. I, I should have looked up the the miles that they had to travel. But for that water to back up like that is an absolute miracle. And to see the coming down of Pharaoh and his army and the lifting of the staff and the waters parted. And, and I've had a lot of fun with that thought. But I want you to know that is an amazing miracle. The Bible says they walked across on dry land. Right. Amen. It was dry. It wasn't muddy. And the water congealed. The Hebrew language says congealed. In other words, turned to jello. That means whatever fish was right there was stuck in place. Amen. I mean, you could walk across and fish at the same time. Just pluck it right out of there. Amen. Provide for yourself all the way across. And then once they got across, when Pharaoh tried to get across with his army, amen, Moses stretched his staff, the water comes back together, and those iron chariots and the horses and the men all drown. 
It was an amazing miracle when you sit back and realize, look what the Lord done did. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. That they learned that God would never leave them. Forty years of circling, amen, the promise God stayed with them. You would think you'd get mad and say, enough is enough. Amen. And he did a few times, but God stayed his hand. Amen. And they learned repentance, you know, through the rebellion, the vipers, the ground opened up. Uh, he, Moses lifting up the, the snake in the wilderness, amen, when he did that, look and live. If you look at this, you live. That's why the scripture says in Hebrews, to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame. Amen. We're looking toward the cross. We've got to keep looking toward him. The only way to keep from staying discouraged, let me say this again, from staying discouraged, because you will get discouraged. Amen. Life, there has some discouragements about it, but you've got to learn how to navigate this wilderness. They learned that God was a was a God of order. Amen. They learned of God's glory. They learned that they could trust God. Exodus 16, 14, I will rain bread down from heaven. I can't imagine that. What a provision. Amen. 400 years of slavery, you come out, and God said, let me, I'm going to provide for you. You're going to get manna. The word manna actually means what is it? What, what, what is it? I don't know what this is, but you can do anything you want with it. By the way, I do not eat tofu. Amen. I, I like the real thing. Can I get an amen? Amen. But they did bring pots and pans out of Egypt. They spoiled the Egyptians. They took things out from them. They borrowed them, which they would never give back. Hallelujah. I think the word today is reparations. Amen. They got it all, <laughs> came out, and here they were. Forty years, they learned that God would provide water, manna, shoes. The Bible says the shoes never wore out. Oh, what a depressing thought, ladies, that your shoes Yet the Lord says, during the 40 years that I led you through the wilderness, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. Amen. This, you're talking about miracle. Miracles, miracles, miracles. All through here, navigating through. And their shoes, not a hole in the bottom, not a patch in their, in, in their, in their tunic. Amen. <laughs> Nothing. I mean, they, 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 they rock it. But as soon as they crossed over the Jordan, into the promised land, it all changed. They had to learn how to hunt. They had to learn how to provide. They learned how, had to learn how to fight. Amen. They, learned, they realized they had to make clothing. Everything changed when they crossed over. To me, it's like when I was a new believer, and I've mentioned this uh, last week when I was at Pastor Kenneth's. When I first got born again, H, I could pray for things. They happened. I prayed God take the moles off my hands. He took them off my hands and off my feet. Amen. I'd pray to get a job. I'd get a job. I could pray for you to get well, and you, you'd get well. Amen. I just saw things happen. It was like bang, 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 bang. I saw the mirror. And then, like, it, the cloud lifted, and I found out that life ain't always that way. Amen. And sometimes I prayed, and it felt like God didn't hear me. I thought, where are you at? And I had to learn to live by faith. Amen. To believe God that no matter what happens, he's still in charge. Hallelujah. And it's been 40 years now for me, 42, 41, 42 years now that I've been serving God. Amen. And, and so I can look back and tell you, I've seen victory, and I've seen times I've just had to endure. And so have you. Amen. We've all had roadblocks. Can I get an amen? Amen. We rarely, rarely think straight. When you get discouraged, you get cloudy. They don't think right. But the people grew impatient because the way was hard. It was hard for them. They were struggling with it. Amen. They got discouraged. Discouragement is a dangerous thing to stay in. Amen. We often can get discouraged, but don't stay there. The dis discouragement came on the tale of great victories. It's amazing to me that after a great victory, how depressed you can get. Amen. You're riding high, and all of a sudden, Monday. Amen. You're down, man. I mean, it, it, it is that way. It, it, the military teaches after, after there's a great victory, you prepare yourself again for the next onslaught because it's coming. And oftentimes, we spiritually, we have a great victory, and we begin to allow ourselves to, we disarm ourselves, if you would. They aim their discouragement at the wrong thing. Have you ever been the brunt of somebody's wrong thing? Amen. They discouraged, they mad, they upset, God this, God that. And because it didn't happen, they're going to blame you for it. And you hadn't been anywhere around, but you're going to take the blame for it. Amen. They're going to hit you on this thing. I've often felt like and am God's representative. I understand that. So are the, the men. So are you, by the way. Amen. And oftentimes in your life, People know you love God, and when certain things they don't, well, they look at you like, and they get mad at you. Amen. They get upset. So they got mad at Moses. Amen. They got mad at uh, Aaron. They got mad at, at God. And so they aimed at, at, at that moment, and they focused on their problem and not on the problem solver. By the way of the Red Sea, 
The Red Sea of all places should have reminded them of how big God is. Amen. In other words, they were still near the waters to see where the miracle happened, and yet they got discouraged. They forgot. I, I keep little uh, back home, we call them whatnots, but little things around to remind me of the miracles that God has done in my life. Amen. It could be a ring. It could be a knife. It could be a watch, but something I held on to. Amen. It, it, it can be a gun, uh, which I'm still collecting, by the way. Amen. Uh, throw that out there. Birthday next month. Uh, uh, so anyway, the, uh, but, but, I, but I got things that remind me of the greatness of God. Amen. And oftentimes when I would leave a place as a pastor, I would bring something with me. First church I pastored the building, I brought a chair with me. I put it in the new, in the new building. It didn't match anything, but that chair reminded me of the goodness of God in the land of the living. When I left that building, I took something from that building and put it in another building. I've often taken my Bibles and buried them underneath pulpit. Amen. I, I move things around. I remind myself of the goodness of God in the land of the living. you got to do that. You got to stay on top. And you got to hang around people that remind you to be reminded. Amen. When you separate yourself, that's when you get in trouble. When I look at what God did for them, amen, I, I, I remind myself that there was an um, emotional disconnect because of the discouragement that took place. It happened in the life of a lot of the great leaders. Moses got mad, he struck the rock. Anger and discouragement came over him. He just got fed up, amen, and he struck the rock. Abraham, Amen. Ended up with Hagar. Amen. By not listening to the promises, he got discouraged because his wife Sarah was discouraged. Noah got drunk. Somebody said that he, Noah was what? That's terrible, Pastor. For Noah, listen. If I stuck you on a boat for 365 days with only your family to help clean up, and the boat landed, do you know the very very first thing Noah did after the boat landed? He planted grapes. Somebody said, "Wow, look at that! He's gonna make a salad." Uh uh. Amen. That boy squashed them things up. He fermented them things. He's an original moonshiner. Can I get an amen? Amen. He got drunk. He said, enough for this right here. Esau sold his birthright for beans. Elijah asked God to kill him. He was so discouraged. He had in a cave running from a woman named, uh, what was her name? Jezebel. Was it Jezebel? Yeah, Jezebel. I'm trying to remember one of them mean women back there. Jonah asked God to kill him while he's in the belly of the well. Samson gave his secrets away. Peter went back to fishing. Amen. The great artist Van Gogh, he took his life at age 33 because he's discouraged. Discouragement, my friend, is a wedge. It's something that if there was one thing that Satan could ask God, let me keep, just let me hold on to it. I just want a wedge of discouragement because I'd put it in the armor of every believer and I'd shove it in there until they're so discouraged they'd give up. Discouragement happens. Amen. You've got to navigate yourself around those detours. You've got to stay with it. They were much discouraged. You know, sometimes we get discouraged because I use the word erroneous. I learned it, you big word, erroneous theology. E erroneous, because I hear a lot of different theologies from people, the way they think about God. Amen. God should have done this, and God should have done that. Amen. When, when God fails to live up to your theology, you know what you do? You change your theology. Mm. It is your expectations that are flawed, not God. Hold that right there just a minute. Many times we're not careful. Uh, our children will change our theology by the way they live. Amen. We allow other people to change our theology. I know a man who's, who believed that he was a great preacher. He still is a great preacher. Amen. Believed in the blood plus nothing, he, that, that salvation is by the, what Christ did on the cross. Amen. Everybody had to turn to Jesus. But then his grandfather re re rejected God. He rejected God. He rejected God. And the preacher said, man, listen, you can't reject God. If you reject God, you're going to go to hell. But I believe that in the Bible. You're going to go to hell if you reject God. He rejected, and he died. And because of that, that man changed his theology based off of his grandpa and started preaching a, a word called inclusion, that no matter who you were, Muslim, Islamic, no matter if you were Catholic, Pentecostal, atheist, agnostic, amen, everybody's going to heaven. He believed that because he didn't want to believe that his grandpa would go to hell. Listen, I have relatives that I've loved that I'm pretty sure are not going to make heaven. Amen. They lived a life without God. They were godless. They didn't care about God. They hurt one another in the family. They lived their own life all the way to the end. And yet some of them, some of them, watch this, got to the end of their lives, lived any way they wanted, and got right to the end and called me, and I went and prayed for them. They gave their life to Jesus. You know what I believe by the grace of God? That I will see them in heaven. 
Amen. Because they called on the name of the Lord. That's what the Bible teaches us. But here's what I would, I meet some folks who go, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to live like hell until I get to the end, and then I'm going to ask God to forgive me. Are you that stupid that you would take that chance? Amen. To get all the way there. And I'm not saying God wouldn't save you all the way to the end, but the, but the abundant life that Christ offers, amen, of forgiveness and love and peace and joy and all the things that the family that you get to connect with, you're going to leave all that behind to live any old way, and you're going to cut your life short by living any old way you want? Come on, Jesus. I need help here. Amen? Amen. I, I, I want to serve God. But listen, I want my theology to be correct, and my theology has to line up with this book. Amen. If Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life, then there's nobody that goes to the Father except through him. Then if that offends you, <clears throat> well, you have to get over it. Amen. Because I want you in heaven with me. And I believe that, that he is he resurrected. Everything he said about himself was true. Hallelujah. Hey, and, and I'm not here trying to say, well, God's a mean. He's not a mean God at all. Go check out some of your mother little G's. I mean, there's, there's some mean gods over there. So let me get back over here. Amen. So defeat is when our way impacts our faith. Victory is when our faith, motion activated, impacts our way. I start believing God for good things. It's a two-sided coin. It's delight and discipline. you got to let the Word come to you. One of the great things about serving God is the more you memorize the Word, the more you understand the Word, it starts coming to you. Now watch this. In the beginning was the, and the Word was, and the Word was with God. Amen. So the Word is Jesus. The Word was God in the beginning. So in the life of Paul the Apostle, before he was Paul, he was Saul, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, self-righteous theology, amen. Everything about him said, if I can memorize the book, I'm right with God, I'm, I'm going to walk the line, you got to do the right thing, you got to wear the right thing, you got to talk the right way, amen. God changed his name and gave him revelation of grace and love. As a matter of fact, it was Paul that said, the reason I've got a thorn in my flesh is because I've got such a great revelation of God. Amen. God humbled me and put a thorn in me. Amen. He did something to me that I prayed three times to be taken away, and the pain's not been taken away yet. This was Paul. Amen. What happened, the message made the man. The man don't make the message. So when you look at it, many times it's not going to the Word that changes things. It's waiting for the Word to come to you. Man, you're in a bad place in life, and all of a sudden the Word comes to you. It reminds you that you can be well. You can get out of discouragement. You can Amen. Overcome. You can't be more than an overcomer. Can I get an amen? Amen. The greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. You get into a place in life where you just want to say, I'm done with it. And God reminds you, I put you here to be a grandma, a grandpa, a parent, amen, a friend to somebody else. It ain't always about you on this journey. You're going through this wilderness, but amen, it's about somebody else. So reach out to that person. Amen. The message found him. He did not find the message. The message made the man. You cannot carry what you've not received. Listen to me. There were those who tried to kill Paul. Listen to what Paul said. Paul says this in uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. For to me to live is Christ. To die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Jesus, which is better by far, but is more necessary for you that I remain in this body going through this wilderness. I added that last part. This to me overwhelms me because this man's love for Jesus was so strong that he felt a literal pull away from gravity to go and be with Jesus. And he said, let me tell you something. The message came to me, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. In other words, they came after Paul to kill him. They stoned him. You want to stone me? Go ahead and kill me. To die is gain. That ain't what I want to hear. I want to hear you deny Jesus. Ah, I ain't denying him. To die is gain. Well, then we're going to let you live. We're just going to make life rough on you. All right? To live is Christ. And I'll encourage everybody when I'm in jail. Amen. I'll encourage everybody on every ship that wrecked with me. I'll encourage everybody on every island with me after I get bit by a snake and shake it off. I, that's how I'm going to live. The message made him. The message makes I meet people that can go through storms. My God. Hurricanes, ice storms, spouses leaving, 
life happening, and I look at them, and they got peace, and I say to myself, this made them. Hey, man, you can't do this without this. You know, I think about your mama, Jessica. I think about Miss Linda all the time. You know, as I mentioned to many of you last week, my wife and I, are, she's going through cancer, which means now we're going through cancer. She means we'll get you getting treated. She's doing well. She step it up. I'm proud of her. But it's been a battle for three months. And your mother made the difference in my wife's life, how she handled cancer. Amen, for all those years. And there's many in this house that have gone through it, and you kept your faith, you pressed through, you didn't see it as a death sentence. Amen. You decided, I'm not going to let it rule me. I'm going to rule it. Hallelujah. That's how I've always felt about my muscular dystrophy. It ain't going to rule me. I'll rule it. Amen. I'll tell it what to do. You ain't telling me what. Can I get an amen? Amen. Let the message make you. Good preaching, preacher. Thank you. Amen. So Second uh, uh, Corinthians 12, 10. This is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, as Paul said, in insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let me close with a few things here. Facing discouragement. And again, you've got to learn how to navigate this through the wilderness as you're going through it. You're going to hit places, and you're going to have to trust God. So first I tell you, stay in the Word. Get the Word of God in you. Guard what is going in. Guard what is going out. Amen. Get the word in you. Tony, I talked with David last week, and he told me the difference in your life has been this book. Amen. It changed you. It's the word that changed you. Amen. The more we get it in us. Second, focus on the right thing. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Start thinking about right things. Three, to me, the most important, stay in fellowship. Stay in fellowship. See, I know, I know so it's, somebody once said it's the banana that leaves the bunch that gets peeled. Amen. I understand that. Stick with the bunch. Amen. Hang with the tribe. But stay within the church. Keep fellowshipping. But there's so many little groups that we have in this church that get together. We say, well, you know, Pastor, I, I don't know. I, 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 get with them. Fellowship with them. Hang out with them. When the phone calls, Quit making excuses to stay in your house. Go out and eat with them. Shoot, they may be buying. It could happen. It could happen. I know many of you think the only reason I get called is they, they want me to pay for it. No, it could happen. But if it don't, still enjoy the fellowship. Hey Amen. Fellowship is so important. Listen, I, as a pastor now of 28, 29 years, I, I expect divisions. I know they can happen. They often don't, but I know that could happen. You got to expect delays, roadblocks, detours, potholes, dry holes. Amen. Sometimes the water ain't there. You got you got to expect dry times. Last week I I watched I was in a situation where I was preaching at ten o'clock so I could watch Pastor David that morning. While I was watching, I looked. And I saw Natalia come in here and brought you water. And I said to myself, I'm going to mention that. Because ain't nobody ever brought me water up here in a long time. In a long time. Been a while since I've got water brought. I thought, I'm going to mention that. So when I saw that water, every now and then you get dry. Somebody got to bring you some water. Somebody got to bless you. Can I get an amen? Amen. Listen to Ecclesiastes 4 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity, pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them. If God wanted this thing to stay at two people, he'd start with Adam and Eve. But he created a family. And as he did, he said, this is what I want the family to do. Two, three, four. I want y'all to get together because when you stay together, if one falls down, somebody can help you up. But pity the one who's alone when he falls. You know, I know sometimes it's, it's romanticism to say, I just want to move to Montana, live in a cabin all by myself without internet. And nobody thought that in this building. Amen. Lately, anyway. But the truth of the matter is, it drives you nuts. You go crazy. You start thinking your own thoughts. We need one another. 
We need help. Can I get an amen? Amen. We need fellowship. And then just stay. Ephesians 6 says, Therefore put on the full armor of God. That's a helmet of salvation, knowing you're saved, breastplate of righteousness, loins girt about with truth, sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, amen, the shield of faith, feet shod in the preparation of the gospel. Hallelujah. You, you guard it everywhere but your back. Amen. And as I put on this armor, so that when the day of evil comes, listen, we not hit the evil day yet. We've hit some bad days, but we ain't hit the evil day yet. When the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand. You'll just be able to stay. Stay faithful. Amen. Stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, you just keep standing. You keep standing. What we need in 2022 is stay faithful and keep standing. Can I get an amen? Stay in the Word. Stay in the fellowship. Navigate the wilderness. Amen. Wherever you're at, right, just keep navigating through it. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for the Word of God. Lord, I know there is a rebuking of discouragement. I understand it. There are times we can say it and it just leaves. And there are other times we got to fight through it. Help us stay in the Word. Let the message come to us and make us. Let us not be angry with the leaders, and with you, for the situation that we're in. Remind us that this too will pass. And then when it moves to the other side, we'll be to the other side. I thank you for a life that says to live is Christ, to die is to gain. Lord, we're looking for the gain time in life. We know it's coming soon, but until then, help us live in this land. Help us stay away from the discouraging thoughts that can destroy others. Remind us it's not always about us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise. I've been wanting to do that since last week. Refreshing. Amen. As Pastor David comes. This is your Genesis. Can I encourage you that if you have never tithed before, just 10%, amen, that you do that today, that you start. Amen. Start this year off, right? Amen. Start, just say, start believing God. And I want to tell you what I've said. For 20 something years, 28 years now, 29, started pastoring in 90. That if when you start tithing and you can't make it, financially you're struggling. You started tithing and you believe it's because you're tithing is the reason why you ain't making it. Within a few months of you tithing, I mean, be serious with your tithe. We'll write your check and we'll give your tithe back. And I will write on that check. God lied. Because I don't believe God's a liar. I've been tithing now for 42 years. God has never failed me. Amen. By the time I get to the end of the year, I look at my W-2. We had people come to church and say, listen, I need to make sure my tithing is at least, at least equal to 10% of my W-2. Amen. I had a man show up on the 31st. He said, I ain't seen you all year, Pastor. My wife's had cancer. I've had to stay home. I've been keeping up with it. But he showed up at my house on the 31st and brought his yearly tithe check. And, amen. And I see that, I say, okay. This guy, you know what that does? It keeps you connected. It keeps the missionaries taken care of, the staff taken care of, the church taken care of. But the biggest thing is it honors God because you believe him. Amen. So in front of you is an offering envelope. Please take that. Just trust God with what you've got. Amen. And again, you say, well, Pastor, I ain't ready to do that yet. Well, just give your best offering. Amen. If you can't do that, I'm just glad you're here. Hallelujah. And that goes for you watching online. You've got to be giving online also in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give it up for your pastor. That's right.